Hey, hello everybody. Uh, this is Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Welcome to this Wednesday night Bible study for the Church of the Eternally Secure. With me again, as usual, is Sister Renee. Sister, want to say hi to everybody? Hey guys, thanks for coming. Sorry I'm a couple minutes late. We do it right after my church service, so I try to get here. Okay, well, uh, we're going to try to pick up where we left off last time with the uh, sermon from uh, Paul Washer, but uh, um, I, I don't have a, the place where we left off marked, so I'm only guessing. Uh, let, uh, what we're going to do is read a little bit, and then we'll give you our, our feedback on, on what Paul Washer says here. Okay, he says, now let me just say something about how that would change everything in America if the media truly believed that. What kind of God do we have in America? What is the God of the politician in America? It's this kind of God. It's a God you can pray to, but you cannot define who he is. It's a God you can talk about in a political speech, but you cannot define what his will is. And that's a good God to have. Why? Because you're no longer accountable to a God like that. You don't have, you don't know who he is and you don't know what he wants. So you just do whatever your carnal, wicked hearts wants you to do. That's a very convenient God. That's the kind of God some supposed Christians have. Let me stop there. I have some thoughts on that, sister. Uh, uh, Please go ahead. Uh, let me get this right here. Okay. Uh, I, I made the video titled uh, Closet Christians. And I, I make, a, a, I think, a similar point that he's making here, except that I don't, uh, I don't focus on uh, how hard a Christian's working to prove their salvation. I, well, I know that's a lie, so that's not my point at all. But I do make the point that... It, it seems to be very socially acceptable for a person uh, to talk about God in a generic sense. I mean, if you have a group of people in a room and they're talking about life and their families and their activities and even politics, and, and then someone says, well, um, yeah, well, that's what, that, that's not what God would want or something, and, or whatever they say. If they reference God, G-O-D, and period, don't elaborate a generic kind of God, you're probably not going to get much of a, a you know, a reaction. Uh, but if that person defines who the God is, if it's the God we believe in, our great Savior God, Jesus Christ, the God of the Bible, and we say Jesus is our God, well, that's totally a different story. The kind of reaction you're going to get from the, your little social gathering there, all of a sudden you might find it gets very dramatic suddenly because you've interjected the name of Jesus instead of just, you know, just being like politically correct and, and just mentioning God in a generic sense. So in that way, I don't have any fault in what he's saying, but he's going to get into uh, the, the idea that, uh, well, the idea that people... I think we all believe that one reason that atheists particularly and, and non-believers uh, are against God is because they think that that would make them accountable to God. It does, but they think this, this sin is the issue. They don't understand that sin is no longer the issue between man and God because Jesus paid for the sins of all mankind. So the issue that remains today is it's a son issue, as we say, not a sin issue. And so, and what are your Paul thoughts Washer, on that? Paul Washer is here and up and up. And he still he thinks there's condemnation. He still thinks there's condemnation. There's chastisement, but not condemnation. And he's he's mixing up, you know, uh, how we live our life as what gets or keeps us saved or proves our salvation. That's where he's messing up. No, that, that's a matter of spiritual maturity. Uh, he believes that. If you're saved, you must live your life for God to be saved, stay saved, to prove you're saved. And that's the error right there. 
Um, but that's where he's going with this. Our God demands holiness. Our God demands, he doesn't demand it, but we know that our God is holy. And we know that our God wants us to love others as he loved us. And we know that God hates sin. And because we love him, we should be doing that. But he's making it a salvific issue. And that's where I got the big problem. If he was preaching this and saying, but remember, you're saved by God's grace. So you should be doing these things. Not saying you're not really saved. That's the issue I have with it. I don't mind hard preaching against sin. I just have a problem with people making it like uh, sin is still an issue uh, for the person that trusts Christ as far as keeping you out of heaven. And that's, that's where I see the problem. here. Yeah. Um, now we're, we're, we're reading a sermon and then we're commenting. So we're in a way we're critiquing his sermon. Uh, I'm not just trying to find fault in everything he says. If he does say something that I think is good, I'm certainly not going to uh, uh, criticize it. Um, so occasionally he might something that I met another thing. This is kind of a, a technique that he's mastered. And that is he's really good at mixing a little bit of truth in. And so you think uh, you're on the same page with him and, and then he twists it and reinterprets uh, the, what the verse means. He's telling us over and over again what a verse means. But we don't agree. That's that's not the real meaning of the verse, as you'll see as we go con continue. No, and that's what his followers often come to me and say, no, he preaches it's grace through faith. But see, they subtly bring in damnable heresies because they backload the works in. They say, yeah. no, it's grace. But if you're really saved, you'll do this, this, and this. Mm -hmm. And uh, you must do these things, live your life for Christ in order for him to give you the free gift. But that's that's a deal. That's a collaborative effort. That's a trade. That's not a gift. Yeah. Amen. Uh, okay. Let's read a little bit more. Uh, it, it'll be very obvious to everybody. If you missed the very first uh, part of this, uh, we're probably about a third or a fourth way through his, his this study on his sermon. But uh, if you missed the first one, uh, he spent uh, a lot of time telling everybody how well, when I give this sermon, boy, you're going to get angry. You're going to, it's going to really make you upset. But I don't care how much it upsets you because I'm going to tell you the truth because I care about you. But unfortunately, what, the way he is interpreting the verses is not the truth at all. So let's continue a little bit. He says, but John, talking about uh, the Apostle John in his writing, he says, John counters that, and he says uh, this, No, my friend. God has told you exactly who he is, and God has told you exactly what he requires of thee, old man. He's not a hidden God. Now, learning that, let's go to the next verse. He says this, if we say that we have fellowship with him, what does that mean? If we say that we are saved is exactly what it means. I need to interrupt you there. No, yeah. that is not what it means. If we say we're walking with him and we do these things, then the truth isn't in us. But that doesn't mean you're saved. Just because you're saved doesn't mean you have fellowship with God. You could have received the free gift and isn't walking in your faith. He's mixing that first John letter, which is about fellowship to believers on how to have fellowship with God and with other brethren. So their joy may be full. And he's making that a salvation uh, letter. And it's not. I just wanted to say, remind everybody of that because we did last week. Yeah. Uh, so uh, everybody who's listening, uh, pay very close attention because what he does is he'll tell you a verse, then he tells you what the verse means. And sometimes he tells you a verse, but uh, let's say the verse is 20 words. He'll read, uh, you know, half of it and then interject his own eisegesis, inserting his own uh, uh um, a doctrinal position into the middle of the verse and then go on. So th this is the technique that he's using. Um, all right, let me read a little further. He says, if we say that we know him, if we say that we abide in him for so many years in America, because of a certain seminary that has propagated this, we have been taught and led to believe that First John is talking about the difference between a Christian who walks in communion with God or a Christian that does not walk in communion with God. Well, that's the point you were making. You're 
you know, he's he's going to really disagreeing with you, sister. He's saying that this is not talking about walking in communion or what we would call fellowship. Uh, the verse actually uses the word fellowship, so he's he's uh, saying walking in communion. But um, I can tell you, I can prove him wrong in his by using the same letter because John refers to these people as little children. They are already brethren. They are saved. And he's speaking to them about people that aren't saved and are antichrist. He's speaking to save people about having fellowship with God and fellowship with others and, and telling them their joy may be full if they treat and love the brethren as Christ loved the church. And at the end, he says, I write these things to you, little children, that you sin not. These are saved people telling saved people to sin not. Stay away from idols. Mm -hmm. He is not speaking to unsaved people here. Yeah. Okay. Well, let me see. Um, for for um, they they take this text to mean that if we say that we know him, if we say that we know him, if we say that we know him, and yet walk in darkness. We're just a confused Christian. That's not what this text means. Well, according to Paul Washer, let's see what he says it means. What this text is saying is this. If we say that we have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. If we say that we are a Christian and yet walk in darkness, we are lying. Now, I know what's going to happen in your heart right now. Yeah, but you don't know my heart, Brother Paul. I know that I know that I know that I'm saved. Uh, that sounds familiar. That's what Brother Matthias likes to say, right? Um, and he says, Paul Washer says, well, I could care less again about your heart because that's not what John said. John says, if we say that we have fellowship with God, that we are a Christian, and yet we walk in the darkness, we are a liar. Now, what does it mean to walk in the darkness? Well, let's stop there for a second. Sister, what is your, what's your um, feedback for his, his, his statement there? He's okay, saying, two things John addresses here. He addresses the false brethren, that deny the Lord that bought us, that are antichrist, right? That's walking in darkness, having another Jesus, all right? Then he's also discussing idolatry at the end. That's walking in darkness. He's also, the main issue here is that the brethren aren't loving one another. And that is a sin. And so when you don't love one another, you're walking in darkness. And whoever sins is of the devil. You shouldn't be serving the devil as a saved person. You'd be serving the one that saved you, and that is Jesus. So the whole thing here is not a salvific issue. Again, they're little children. They're his brethren. They're saved. He wants their joy to be full. The fellowship with other brethren, not hating other brethren, is the main issue of this. Uh, and so if you're hating a brother and say you're in the light, well, you're not in the light because you're walking in hatred. You're lying. And he also addresses if you say you have not sinned, the truth isn't in you. Because there's a Gnostic teaching he's addressing that there is no such thing as original sin and so forth. So there's a lot going on here. But the main thing about walking in darkness when you read First John is not loving the brethren. Mm -hmm. well, I don't know why he's making this a salvation issue, but... A lot of uh, preachers do this. A lot of lordship preachers love First John. Mm -hmm. right. yeah. And James. they love James too, because they love to twist James. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Uh, sister, would you like to read at any point uh, so I don't do all the reading? Let me see. Uh, you, you see where we are? Uh, let me just finish this paragraph and then you can pick it up. Um, now, what does it mean to walk in the darkness? Well, first of all, you need to understand what darkness is. It's the opposite of light. If we say we are a Christian and yet we walk, now what does it mean to walk? 
peripateo, uh, to walk around a style of life. If we say we are a Christian and yet our lifestyle, our style of life contradicts everything God has told us about himself and contradicts God's will, we're a liar. <laughs> That's what it means. That's what this text is saying. It's a clear as a bell. Sister, that is it clear? John doesn't mention lifestyle at all, not once in that letter. Yeah. Not once does he mention how you live. The walking in darkness is hatred of the brethren. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He doesn't mention that. He doesn't mention anything that John's actually talking about. He's just putting his own, like you said, eisegesis in. If you don't have a lifestyle, your style of life, that's what, what no, no, it has nothing to do with that. I'm going to pull it up while you read. I'm going to pull that up and read that section. Yeah. Okay. Um, he says, now listen to me. Listen to me. I'm going to tell you again. Look at this in verse six. If we say that we have fellowship with him, if we say that we are a Christian and yet we walk, we lead a style of life in the darkness, we lead a style of life that contradicts the attributes and the nature of God. What God has told us about himself, our style of life reflects nothing of God's character. And our style of life totally contradicts what God has said to be his will. Then we are a liar when we say we are a Christian. We've got to understand this. Do you have ears? You've got to understand it. There are so many people walking around. You can see them. It's like a fog over their heads. That is why religion is so dangerous. Wow. Wow. Um, well, I got to say something right here about this word religion and how he's using it. Uh, I say religion is dangerous, but I'm not using religion the way that he does. I would say what he is preaching what he wants us to do in his message, that would be religion. Religion is uh, simply a uh, trying to follow a, a, a system of do's and don'ts in your attempt to earn approval or acceptance from God. That's religion. All religions are the same. Uh, it doesn't matter if all the different denominations of uh, Christendom. It doesn't matter if it's, uh, you know, Islam or, or, or Jehovah's Witnesses or any, all religions think that you go to heaven, you reach nirvana or whatever, however they understand that, they think this is accomplished by improving your life and getting, become a better person so God can accept you. That's religion. And that's what he's preaching. Exactly. But, but, but the problem is religion can't save anybody because nobody can ever reach this acceptable level that God requires because they, the level of, that is required is perfection. That's why uh, real Christianity, this kind of Christianity that we find in the Bible is not based upon do's and don'ts. It's based upon done. It's everything that's required has already been done. It was accomplished by Jesus on the cross. We trust in what he's done for us. We rely on that. And that's not what Paul Washer. Salvation is what God did for us, not what we do for him. And Paul Washer, I'd like to know what his lifestyle standard is. How, how do we know what we're good enough for Paul Washer? We don't drink. We don't, for, we don't fornicate. Is that it? We go to church twice a week, three times a week. What's the lifestyle he's talking about? Can I read that section of 1 John that he's twisting up, talking about lifestyle? As yeah. nothing to do with lifestyle. The fellowship, walking in darkness, is not having fellowship with God and hating the brethren. All right? First of all, he writes to little children, the saved, about unsaved, about Gnostic teaching, and about a fellowship. So these things we write unto you so that your joy may be full. Not so that you question your salvation, not to examine to see if your lifestyle proves you're saved. But he says, this then is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. Walking in darkness prior is talking about the antichrist people that deny the Lord that bought them. 
But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. The truth is not in us. So saying we don't have sin is also walking in darkness. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. What does that mean? These people were denying that original sin. They claim they don't sin. And he's saying, if you say that, the truth isn't in you. You can't be saved unless you admit you sin. If you confess you're a sinner, then he'll cleanse you from that sin. And it says, if we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. So it has nothing at all to do with lifestyle, but the denial of being a sinner in need of a savior and uh, fellowship, hating the brethren and Gnostic teaching so far has nothing at all mentioned about lifestyle. Yeah. Um, now you, you read through oh, verse nine, right? If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just if cleanses our sin, forgive us our sins and cleanses from all unrighteousness. You went that far. Okay. This is the point. I'd like to interject some thoughts of my own on this. I think I first heard this from Ryan Rufus, but this is how I think we should understand this portion of first John. First of all, what is it? It's a letter. Now, just like all the other letters, the letters were written in, with the intention of being read to a congregation. Even if it's addressed to a person, they're expected that that person would give it to the church and they'd read it to the congregation. Okay. Now, the people actually listening to us right now, or the people who join us every Sunday, I think we've got a high percentage of people in our congregation that are saved. But there are some people, baby, who are just watching out of curiosity. There are some people who are watching because someone asks, hey, watch this with me. I want you to listen to this. You know, it's like taking a friend to, to church, okay? So you've got to understand every sermon is, is uh, if it's to a congregation that's not entirely a believers. It's a mix. So I think that there's part of this that is being directed to um, just like we present the gospel at every one of our Sunday uh, broadcasts, we always finish with the gospel message because we assume that some people uh, don't understand these basic things. So we go over the basic things and explain to them. That's what this portion of scripture is, is intended for, in my opinion. It's that if it says that if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Yeah. The, the Gnostics, that's an argument against the Gnostic position. It's also an argument about any person who's so full of pride and self-righteousness, they think that they, are, they, they don't have a need for Jesus because they've got it covered themselves, that they're so good. They're, uh, but we need to make a person understand when we're presenting the gospel in our evangelism message, one thing we need to make someone understand is a, is a kind of prerequisite understanding is that Look, we're all sinners. You can't deny that you're a sinner like me. Now, you know, some sin more than others. We have different types of sins, but you can't, you have to understand you're a sinner and that's why you need the Savior. So that's the point that's being made here. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. We need to make people understand that. Then the next point is, however, now, if we confess our sin, now it doesn't say sins, does it? Am I wrong or is it say? No, you confess you're a sinner. If we confess our sin, that means that we are a sinner, our sinful condition. If we confess that we are actually a sinner, if we understand that and realize that and understand that, hey, I, because of that, I'm in trouble. Then if we confess our sin. He is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and cleanses of all righteous. This is the gospel message in that. Understand, I, if you're listening now, and you don't know how to get saved, understand that you're a sinner. Understand that if, if Jesus paid for your sins, you gotta realize you're, you've sinned in order to realize he's paid for them, and you're, you're cleansed from all unrighteousness because of what Jesus has done for you. So I believe this portion is to the part of the congregation that is not yet believers that say, hey, for everybody who doesn't understand this, if, and you Gnostics, 
if they're Gnostics in the congregation here teaching people this, I want you to understand, no, you got to understand you are a sinner. Everybody's a sinner, but we can have our sins forgiven because of Jesus. Right, and he also says in First John, we know we know him when we keep his commandments, but the context of that is we recognize each other as brethren when we keep the commandments to love one another and believe on him because the commandments he gave was to believe on him and to love one another as I have loved you. And so when John says uh, his commandments are not grievous and reading the rest of first John, it's clearly in the context of loving the brethren. Um, and so we know, we know, and we recognize each other as belonging to God when we keep his commandments, yeah. uh, when we love each other. Uh, and then it says, whosoever keeps his word in him, verily is the love of God perfected. Hereby know we that we are in him. And he said, now here we, here, here's, a, here's a good one. He that saith he abideth in him ought himself also to walk, even as he ought, even as he walked. So if you're in him, you should be walking as he walked. Okay. So there's clearly some that are in him that aren't walking the way they should walk. And the very general thing he's he's uh, referencing here is treating the brethren with love. Yeah, uh, you know uh, there are a lot of people that um, take the verse uh, that says we rightly divide the word of God, and um, th then they they go to an extreme with not understanding what that means. They, they, they think that you take Paul's letters and separate those and everything else. It's not important. That's just to the, the Israel and the Jews. Uh, so they're, they're greatly mistaken, but there is an, an rightly dividing. What we, what you really need to do to, if you want to rightly divide is you want to understand the difference between must and should. When it says you, you should do something like in, in, um, uh, Ephesians uh, two ten, it says we should do these good works because God has ordained it. We should do it, okay? But then, uh, when Paul asks what we must do, we must believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. So understanding the difference between must and should—that's making that distinction—is rightly dividing. Understanding the difference between salvation and service. Your, your ministry, your walk, all that, and understand if it's applying to salvation or a standing uh, understanding to your walk or your ministry, your service, your discipleship, whatever you, word you prefer to use in this case, making the distinction between two of these things is rightly dividing. And that's what uh, that's what you, people need to understand in this portion of, of 1 John. Uh, and one other thing I want to say about this, sister, I might be going off a little bit, but uh, there, um, there are there's a group of people that use this portion of first john to justify one of the priests in confessing their sins if we confess our sins he's faithful and just to forgive our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness and they use that to justify the uh going into the confessional booth with their priest uh and then there are even people who think that uh, I, I there's a there's a saint that was a good friend of mine on youtube i haven't seen her for several years now she got tired of YouTube, but uh, but she was so much into First John one nine. She told me that she would uh, uh, confess her sins fifty times a day, twenty times a day, all day long. She's stopping and confessing because she thought that she would lose fellowship with God. And that's not if bondage. If there if there's anything that's not confessed, that that she's out of fellowship with God. What's she going to do about the sin she doesn't even know she commits? Yeah, yeah. But here, the way I want people to understand the fellowship we have with God, our Father, is the parable uh, of the backslidden son. People call it the parable of the prodigal son. But I believe a better description of this situation is the backslidden son. Okay, first of all, he's a son. He has two sons. They're both equally sons to the father, their father. Not one is more or less son than the other, but one of the sons goes off and, and starts uh, living a worldly life, and he turns his back on his father. But his father 
never turns his back on him. His father is waiting all the time with open arms, not even asking for repentance and, and, and anything like that or confession before he embraces him. So the yeah, father- yes, He was dead. Now he's alive. He just wants the best for him. Yes, yes. So pe people who think that they, we can lose fellowship with God because we've gotten uh, some, some sins. Every time we sin, we lose fellowship. And we've got to confess that sin to gain, regain our fellowship. Are really missing the boat on all this? Okay, so that's that's why. Son doesn't I see stop being my son when he's disobedient. Yeah, yeah. He's uh, you know, you, you don't change when the son came was gone away. He was in the pig pen, but he yep. didn't transform into a pig. Mm -hmm. He was still the man's son, but living in the pig's pen, and uh, didn't change his uh, what we call the difference between standing and state. Your standing doesn't change. You're a child of God; nothing can change that. But the state changes. You're either you're either uh, you know uh, backslidden or you're you're not. I believe we're either backsliding or we're growing. I don't think we're ever. According standing. to Lordship Salvationists, most of the Old Testament saints wouldn't have been saved. Yeah. They would say David's not saved because he committed adultery and killed somebody. Lot's not saved because he had two of his daughters get pregnant by him when he got drunk. Yeah. Noah was drunk, got naked. They would say all of them were unsaved. Yeah. Okay. Well, I, I thought it was important for, uh, for us to, for, I wanted to lay my point of view about this portion of scriptures, compare it to Paul Washer, how he's going to apply it. Yep. And, and uh, Okay, so uh, let me read further, or if, if you want, let me see where we are. Brother Luke, another way, because you were very good at saying divide salvation from service, right? Yes. Well, you know, uh, we have to look at, it. is he telling us unsaved people how to get saved here? You know, what? what is the issue? And the, the problem is they're all claiming it's grace through faith, but they're redefining things. And you know that some of the new versions are really sneaky. Celine, one of my viewers wanted me to tell you, she sent me some verses and was comparing them with King James and they changed the word faith to faithfulness, oh. which is completely a different thing. Faith is to take God at his word and rely upon it. Faithfulness is your obedience and persistence and that's works. Do you see how they're subtly adding works and that's what's dangerous because his followers will say no he says it's grace through faith the free gift but then he redefines what these things are and i'm glad you address well hello meow um uh, okay he uh you know the confessing thing it's really important because another way to determine salvation and service and if it's of god does it bring you under bondage and the, the Catholics have a new app where you can confess sins all day, like an emergency thing on their phone. So they can confess to a priest all day. It's bondage. And Hebrews says you should have no more consciousness of sin as if something's got to be done to get rid of it. That was wiped out under the law. Every year they have to animal sacrifice to wipe out the past year's sin. Well, the once for all sacrifice of Christ wiped it out for good, your future ones, because all your sins are future. You don't need to do anything to have them taken off your account positionally. And there's a difference between positional and experiential. So you, some people even take this to mean we confess it for experiential fellowship. But even I say, I don't even think you have to do that. Anything that gives you bondage, that makes you fear and in bondage, instead of in joy and peace and fellowship, it's religion and not faith. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, now, it starts off, we've got to understand this. Uh, would you like to read the finish? No, you can read if you want. My voice keeps going out. Okay. I'll read further then. Uh, it says, Paul Washer says, we've got to understand this. Do you have ears? You've got to understand it. There are so many people walking around. You can see them. It is like a fog over their heads. That is why religion is so dangerous. All these, but that's what he's preaching is being religious. Uh -huh. 
All these silly little boys out here preaching that if you repeat a prayer, you're going to heaven. And the moment they pronounce that upon the person, it is like a fog comes over them. But it's time to cut through that fog with a deeper, greater light. And that is the word of God. None of us say a prayer saves you. Not one of us have ever said that. Yeah. Uh, there is a place for prayer. Uh I believe, I, I say this all the time. But repeating some prayer doesn't save anybody. None of us have ever said, hey, one, two, three, repeat after me, and now you're saved. That's yeah. a work. Right. Is right. A work. right. Right. We all, we'll all argue that, that it is, uh, confessing with your mouth and believing your heart doesn't mean that you've got to say some kind of sinner's prayer to get saved. That is a work. Uh, so, uh, but I do believe that the natural reaction for someone when they understand the gospel and the greatness of the gift is to thank God. Thank you, Jesus. That's the prayer of thankfulness, not of thinking that I've got to do this prayer as a legalistic step to get my salvation. So, yeah, so we, I, we in that way, we agree. They're saying a prayer doesn't save someone. But on the other hand, you can go to another extreme. I mean, it's crazy how people there there is a correct understanding and then you have extremes on either in either direction. Yep. yep. Yeah. So I mean we're gonna say no, we're not gonna require a person to say a prayer in, as a means of getting saved, but I'm also gonna, not gonna tell someone you better not ever pray about that's, your salvation. That's wrong. Oh, pray and say thank you, I'm saved. I, I believe I'm thankful, thankful Jesus, you know. Yeah, I agree with you. Some people go as far to say, don't say it. What? Yeah. No, you're saved by trusting in what was already done for you. Period. Yeah. Everything else is, is, is nothing wrong with it. Pray away. Praise him for saving you. Thank him for saving you. I mean, I don't even, I don't have a problem with a sinner's prayer as long as somebody doesn't think them praying it is saving them. Mm hmm Yes. Okay. Uh, now, he says, my dear friend, listen to me. John is saying that if you say you're a Christian and yet your lifestyle, the way you are, does not reflect his character and the things you do against his will as a style of life, he's telling you, you are a liar when you say you're a Christian. He said no such thing in that letter. He no. said no such thing about if you claim that you're saved and don't have a lifestyle to prove it. It is nothing. He says nothing like that. Like you said, you did a good point, Luke. You made a great point when you said Paul Washer will read a portion of first John and then put what he thinks it's saying and twist it to his understanding and then tell you that's what John's really meaning. He's really talking about your lifestyle. He didn't say anything about lifestyle in this letter. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you're going to see this time after time. He uses that same technique. Uh, so, I mean, really, if you wanted to understand, a lot of times we use all these theological terms. Matter of fact, I've got a whole bunch of words that I've made a list. And in our Sunday study, uh, as soon as we get a chance, uh, I want to, I'm going to ask everybody on the panel to define all these basic words, give our own definitions of what these words actually mean. But here's a word, isogesis and exegesis. If, you, if you've heard these words and you don't know what they mean, exegesis means you read the, you read the Bible and you, you, uh, you, you try to uh, understand what it's telling you and you accept what it's telling you. Isogesis is you have a doctrinal position that you are trying to force into it, even though it doesn't say it. And that's what he's doing. He'll read half the verse, and then he'll try to force in a different meaning, and, and that's eisegesis. Now he said, if we say we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves, and the truth is not in us. There have been strains of Christianity or marginal Christianity down through the history of the church that believed in sinless perfection. I believe in sinless perfection, but only the perfection that Jesus gave me was imputed yeah. righteousness. Imputed righteousness, yeah, yeah not experiential perfection. Yeah. You see, well, the Bible doesn't teach that. 
but it doesn't teach that we can we can uh, have our own righteousness. No, no one is righteous, not even one. But it does teach us that we can have perfection and righteousness, holiness. We're sanctified, declared holy. What is holy? Not sinless, perfect. We're we're sanctified because we put our faith in Jesus. The Bible teaches that even the most mature, the most godly Christian is still susceptible to sin. Okay, okay. No arguing with that, right? No, great. What this is teaching us is this. One of the greatest evidence that a person has truly been born again, that a person is truly a child of God, is that they will be sensitive to the sin in their life and they will be led to repentance and confession of that sin. Okay? Give me your thoughts on that point there. So he's claiming that a, a real Christian will repent of sin and repent of sin and repent of sin, and that's how you know they're a real Christian. No, I'd say a real Christian is somebody that clearly knows that their works and their righteousness are as filthy rags, and they are trusting in what God provided through his son, just the blood. And yes, if a person is spiritually mature and growing in grace through the milk of the word, sin will just fall out of their life. They, they don't desire it as much. They, the spirit is guiding them. We're told not to grieve the Holy Spirit. You know, but uh, I, I, I know that his righteousness he's looking for is don't drink, don't fornicate. Don't cuss. Don't watch worldly movies. He's looking for this outward righteousness. It's written to the teenagers. You know, that's what he's looking for. He's not looking for true fruits of the spirit. Patience, love, kindness, charity, meekness, humility. He's not looking for those. He's looking for outward righteousness. And he is putting his own, uh, for one, repentance like here's a perfect example of repentance i had a hindu uh, and a muslim on my channel stop believing in their false religion and turn to christ they repented unto life they changed their mind from what they trusted in and they trusted in christ alone they realized they needed a savior they were a sinner and only through his shed blood could they be saved they repented now he just thinks repent means to turn from sin. But we know it's a change of mind. That's all it repents unto life is to trust Christ. That's it. But once a person saved, repentance from sin is a work of the Holy Spirit. But the Holy Spirit doesn't force people to do his will. Otherwise, why would it say don't grieve the Holy Spirit? And Paul is given the same objection to free grace. Well, shall we sin so grace may abound? Since we're not under any law, can't we just sin away? He said, God forbid. And then he confirms who they are in Christ. How can we be in debt to sin and live any more therein? Don't you know you die with Christ? You're we baptized into Christ. And we should walk in newness of life. But this is a spiritual maturity issue. A chastisement issue. A reward issue. Not salvific issue. And that's what... Uh, this whole one of his problems is not understanding what true repentance is. God give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth is to change your mind and believe the truth. That's what it is for salvation. Again, that word repent, Satan has done a great job hijacking that word because that we have to go back to the Greek. There's three words for repent. One is to feel sorry or regretful. One is irrevocable, as in the gifts and calling to God are without repentance. He's not going to take them back. And the other one is metanoia, metanoia, which just means change of mind. God repents 38 times. It cannot mean to turn from sin. It can mean that if that's the context, but none of that has anything to do with salvation. So his whole thinking is flawed. He thinks that if you're really saved, you got to be willing to give up your sin. If we have to repent of sin to be saved... And he admits right here that people still sin, didn't he? There's no such thing as sin. Okay, how do we know we repented enough? How many sins? Where's the line? If we can't be perfect, which is God's standard for the law, how much of our righteousness is added to his righteousness? How much of it? How much? What if I repent of a lot of sin, but I got one too many? Where is that line? 
See, we established the law. Law's way up here. It's it's not something that we can achieve and be justified by. So why are we adding this to salvation? It, it just proves to me here he doesn't believe the gospel. Yeah. He doesn't believe that all the sins were purged and there's no condemnation for us. He still thinks there's condemnation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, you know, Paul said that uh, I'm persuaded that nothing, and he has this long list Amen. that can, can uh, ever separate him from the love of God that's in Christ Jesus. Nothing. And nothing just, now and oh, nothing in the future. Yes. Uh, and, and so that is what I would call the blessed assurance. He's so assured, he's so confident, and that, that he's he knows that he's guaranteed nothing can change the promise of eternal life that Jesus made to him. And so, but with with Paul Washer or the Lordship uh, heresy, uh, if a person believes that, they can never have the blessed assurance because they can, even if they think that, uh, okay, they're making an attempt to do these things, they, they can never define, not one of them is able to define exactly what it is they've got to stop doing and, and what they must begin to do, the do's and don'ts, and none of them can ever say to what degree of uh, success is required. Is, is it, like, is it, well, is it a majority? You're 50 on a scale. This is what the, the, the Muslims have a, have a scale. A lot of people use this scale system. You put your good deeds on one side, your bad deeds on the other, and if the scale tilts, you're more good than bad, then God will accept you. Well, you only need 51% good. That's not a very good person if you're only half good. But let's say if you want to you want to get more strict and say it's like a, a, a score on your exam, and oh well, 95% is an A, so you need 95%. But the, no, 95% won't won't do it in the Bible because the Bible says 100% perfect. You have to be if you're gonna if you're going to present yourself to God, you have to present yourself perfect. And I can present myself to God because I have the perfection of Jesus Christ. If you don't have that, the Lordship heretic presenting their own perfection is 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 uh, not perfect. They fall short. Uh, and there was something else. Oh yeah, I wanted to say that uh, this point he makes here. He says um, a per a person is truly a child of God is that they will be. Oh, one of the greatest evidences he says that a person is really a child of God, is that they will be sensitive to the sin in their life and they will be led to repentance and confession of that sin. Okay, so if this is how we get have evidence or proof that someone is saved, if you want to inspect people, if you want to examine people and try to determine if they are really saved or not, uh, are you, you're going to base it on if they're sensitive to sin and if they're repenting all the time, well, guess what? Being sensitive to sin can be caused by one of two things. The accuser. Yeah. Well, yeah. The three things, I'll say. Three things, okay? The accuser plus the Holy Spirit will be grieved. And also, if a person doesn't have the Holy Spirit, they've never received the Holy Spirit, they never believed in Jesus, they're still born with a conscience. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot of people, we can probably think of them, maybe even someone watching, maybe you're that kind of person before you even believe. Maybe you had such a conscience that you were trying to do your best to live a moral, upright, honest life. And I, if you look at a lot of people who are very religious, and they, they're not born again. They don't have the Holy Spirit. Catholics they're, are known for their guilt. Yeah. And they're very, very sensitive. And they're confessing all the time, just repenting and confessing just the way he wants. But those Roman Catholics aren't saved. Those Mormons yeah. aren't saved. Those Jehovah Witnesses aren't saved. Those, uh, those even those uh, secular uh, humanist people who are just very moral and upright. If you didn't know, if you're judging them by how, how upright they seem to be, uh, you, you could you think you think they'd be saved, but no. The only way of judging their salvation is asking them: Are you going to go to heaven? Are you certain? Why? You it's all you go by is when they tell us what they believe. Look, a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. Unsaved people 
They got a form of godliness. They look righteous out here, but they deny the power of Jesus Christ, uh, crucifixion and resurrection. But they got a form of godliness. He's saying to look at that form of godliness. That's how you know they're saved. Nonsense. Satan comes as an angel of light and his ministers come as ministers of righteousness. They're going to seem righteous. You ask a Muslim how to be saved. Repent of your sins. A Jehovah's Witness, repent of your sins. A Mormon, repent of your sins. Every false religion on earth thinks you living a good life is getting you saved or makes you qualify for heaven. It's ridiculous. His standards are not biblical. The fruit of a false prophet, which is what they're talking about by their fruit, you'll know them, is about false prophets. And the fruit is their doctrine, their words. It has nothing to do with their lifestyle. If it had to do with their lifestyle, why would they be wolves in sheep's clothing? They look like a sheep. They live righteous lives. They're law keepers, but they're preaching law for salvation, a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. So he's telling us to look for things that won't prove anything. Yeah. Well, that's that's more verses we'll be coming to that, uh, you know, that he's going to mis misapply, misinterpret and to support its heresy. OK, let me go further. Isn't it amazing? And most pastors, what I preach is they smile. They know exactly what I'm talking about. Whenever I'm preaching in a church and there is a move of God and a move of God with regard to sin, I find it amazing that when people start breaking and in American churches, somebody is coming forward and saying, uh, forward and praying, I think it is quite amazing that it is always the most godly, most devoted, most spiritual people coming forward, weeping over their sin. And it is always the most carnal, godless, hateful, spiteful, wicked church members that sit back, sit back there. Oops, messing with moving this text. They sit back there, cold as stone, as though they were perfect. <laughs> what you, you are seeing is the difference between the lost and the saved in the congregation. Oh, man. Well, if that was true, the Pharisee would be the one that saved, uh, you know. Uh, you know, and he's coming forward and making this big dramatic presentation. But, well, I guess that's not a good example. He's not confessing his sin. He's proclaiming his righteousness. Okay. A true Christian is so, is sensitive to sin. Sensitive to sin. Sensitive to sin. Let me ask you a question. When was the last time you wept over your sin? That's frightening. When was the last time you were broken over your sin? Well, you know what this makes me think? You know what this makes me think? It makes me think if Paul Washer is telling us this, and he's saying he's that kind of a person, he must be really a horrible sinner. Put ash on him. Okay. He has to be weeping over his sin all the time. He has to be obsessed with, with his, uh, uh, it sounds to me like he is obsessed, and he wants everyone else to be obsessed over their sin all the time. And that's the, you know, that slogan, it, this, this is where he missed missing the boat. Now we got another standard, Luke. You got to be emotional. You got to, yeah. you know, overtly emotional to be a real Christian. You yeah. got to prove it. Well, if you were, to, if at you the, were the repentance altar, if you were a, able to actually watch him and hear him give this sermon, he does weep and, and he's he's so the way he delivers the speech is so broken hearted and he's putting on quite a show and that's what he expects everybody to be to be this like this person that's constantly in tears over their sin well guess what here's a here's a confession to everybody for me okay i don't remember the last time i sinned now that doesn't mean i haven't sinned today or yesterday or last week i probably have i probably gotten impatient or upset angry or something i know i haven't done the clear obvious ones like i haven't stole or lied or anything like that my wife just left today she went to connecticut for a month to visit her that's where she grew up you know there the year many many years ago before i was a christian that would be an opportunity for adultery for me 
but I don't think about that anymore. I don't have the desire for that anymore. And I, I, I so what am I saying? Am I trying to make myself like, well, I'm so good that I'm sinlessly perfect? Well, no, it, if, if I have some sin, I have to really think and evaluate myself. Do I have any, uh, any sin? And it would probably be the, the, the type of sin that is uh, uh, maybe sins of omission where I've neglected to do something I could have done for someone. Uh, maybe a sins of the mind rather than, than, than uh, committing uh, you know, uh, overt acts of sin. Uh, but I really don't think I'm saying it that much. The way he wants, he wants everybody to think that, well, even though we're Christian, we're still sinners, we need to be repenting and crying over our sin every day. Well, yeah, if, if I did something, I would feel bad about it. But I don't think that all the, the most Christians, uh, that I don't think we have to be like in a state of broken heartedness all the time. We're supposed to be in a state of joy all the time. Right. Right. And that's what happens if you're if you're always thinking about Jesus instead of thinking about yourself, about your your exactly. Your he convict the Holy Spirit also convicts us of righteousness. Of yes. righteousness. He convicts the world of sin because they don't believe. You know, the accuser is the one that's constantly beating you down about your sin. Oh, you call yourself a Christian and you cuss that guy out. I don't know, let me fall apart. Oh God, I cursed that man out. Oh, I'm such a sinner. I mean, come on. We're supposed to be in joy, like you said. Joy, peace, meekness, understanding, patience. I don't see this anywhere. I see outer righteousness. They're looking for the wrong things. I, I, I'm not in a constant state of tears. I'm almost in a constant state of joy. I am almost... Giddy, that's G I D D Y. Giddy, I'm so happy all the time. Now, does that mean that I'm I've not haven't completely stopped sinning? No, I'm sure I'm, I haven't completely stopped sinning, but I'm not thinking about that. You're not going to be thinking about sin and going to be getting busy doing sin if you're thinking about J Jesus. I have a video. Let's stay focused on Jesus, and when we are, we're not thinking about it. it's. It's like that saying, you know, uh, don't think of a pink elephant. Well, if you try not to think of it, you're thinking of it. And so, you know, he wants us to not think, to, to stop, stop sinning. Well, if you think, you think about sin, that's when your sin's on your mind all the time. You'll constantly be either depressed or, 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 or maybe you'll actually succumb to it because that's what you're thinking about. Oh, it's hard to take. Okay. Uh, some of you don't even know what I'm talking about. When we are a child of God, God guards us. He talks about his jealous love for Israel. Is it not greater for the church? Does God guard you? I can remember my great love for books in seminary. And I went to the bookstore there in seminary to buy a book with a friend of mine. And there were only two volumes left. There were two and there were two of us. I pulled out the first volume and I love books. And there was a little tear on one of the pages. I swapped books with him. I gave him the book and pulled out the other one. We go to the counter. We buy our books. I go home. The whole time, as though I had murdered a man, as though I had murdered a man, and finally praying, having a call, a call, call to him up, uh, coming to call him up and saying, I've got to talk to you. Well, what is it? You can tell me over the phone. No, I can't tell you over the phone. I have got to meet you face to face and then go before him weeping and ask for forgiveness. Why? Because I'm pious? No, because God guards his children. I see Christians, and it's amazing to me. Brother Paul, come and preach for us. We want revival. And yet, before they come to the meetings and after the meetings, they go home and sit in front of a television and watch all that filth. And they're not even sensitive to the sin of it. Are you sensitive to sin? Does it lead you to confession? Now, let me ask you, some of you here, 
let's here's something you need to understand just recently a man that i know was found in grievous sin and someone said how did a man like him fall into sin and i said he didn't fall into sin no man falls into sin he slid there like everyone else let me ask you because some of you may be christians and you you need to hear a warning are you sliding into sin are you starting to do things now gradually gradually that you would not have thought of doing a month ago and a little and little by little by little you know what's going to happen you keep going and it's I'll, it'll be evidence you're lost if God pulls you back it'll be evidence you're saved well, let me pause for a minute just but the, the prodigal son went out there and got the consequences for his sin and the sin had consequences all his friends left him he was starving he was humiliated and he came back home and he wanted to grovel to his father but his father didn't even let him he ran out and threw an, a, a kiss on his neck and just said he was dead but he's alive again he knew what the sin had done to his son he didn't beat him down because of it he just let him know how much he was loved you know it's like i don't, I don't get this why a lot of people are sensitive to sin. Some very religious people are so obsessed with their sin. Like I said, they got the app on their phone, confessing, confessing, confessing. But I think it shows more faith to come to your father and say, I know you love me. And I didn't feel right about what I did. Help me to do better next time. That's how I deal with it. That's how I deal with it. But I don't even, I mean, I, there's some things that aren't really even sin unless you do them against your own conscience like it says uh blessed blessed is the man who does not condemn that which he allows like if you want to hear a certain kind of music now if it's overtly satanic it bothers me but not all things i feel condemned over you know and and if i do feel condemned i just won't do it it's just i i really feel like he's looking at outward righteousness you know, watching wrong movies, you know, taste not, touch not, handle not. That's what he's got. And that's religion to me. I, I just have joy and peace. I know I'm saved. And so I want to live for him. I want my dad to be happy. I want him to know that I love him. But it, I don't fall apart every time I make a mistake. I know the flesh wars against the spirit. St. Paul said that. The good that I would, that I, that I don't. The thing that I hate, that I do. Who will save me from this body of death? Our flesh wars against the spirit. There's no need to fall apart over it all the time. I think this is just ridiculous. It, it's just, it's that old Southern Baptist fall apart, walking down the sawdust aisle, laying your sins at the altar, and crying and if you don't you know fall apart you're not really saved you know it's just ridiculous and by the way i haven't heard anything in this sermon that would tell a person how to be saved and and if they're not saved the holy spirit's not in them and he's the only path to victory to any of the 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 sin that's destroying your life so until you're saved and the holy spirit's in you you'll never even have the desire to change those things you'll try in religious fear and bondage to, to get your flesh under subjection hoping that you can please god in your flesh but you can't so i haven't heard anything about what god did for us or the love of god and how it's the love of christ that constrains us and how the law strengthens sin grace doesn't i haven't heard anything how anybody could be saved yeah. and his whole point is telling you you're not really saved so how do they get saved by falling apart having emotionalism all the time being sensitive to sin it doesn't prove anything okay let me see i've got a request to wrench youtube censorship youtube censorship almost all your comments you end up removing them don't you <laughs> it's funny you all, you're like you're you're wrenching yourself all the time. I don't know. Yeah, I'll wrench you here. Let me see if I can do it right now. 
I didn't find a comment from you though. Where's the comment? Oh, there you are. Okay. 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 All right. You should be wenched now. All right. Well, yeah, that's a very good point, sister. Um, yeah, I'm, re I'm reflecting here and comparing this now for a moment to these, two, um, the other two sermons that we taught on. Um, Spurgeon, uh, on 99% of everything he said, we're saying, hallelujah, praise Jesus. What a great message he's preaching. And it's, it's all about the, the free gift, the free gift, and, and uh, don't add anything to it. And then we, we, we want the one with Jonathan Edwards, uh, uh, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. We, and it's like this one. There's, there's, we're waiting. Where is he going to tell them the gospel? Never once in like an hour and a half sermon or something, 20 pages of text written, never once did he ever tell them how to get saved. There was only even like one sentence that even hinted at, at, about G. I, at a, it wasn't even the gospel. Out of all those 20 pages, and it's the same thing here. Well, well, if he thinks that these people, many of them, he's saying, I suspect that many of you are not saved. Why isn't he telling them how to get saved? I mean, I wouldn't waste any time. I tell them right away. I tell them over and over again the same thing. But what really gets me about both of those sermons is that if I wanted to be miserable, I mean, I'm so miserable, I'd be almost suicidal. I would become that kind of a Christian, a Paul Washer Christian or a, or a Jonathan Edwards Christian. Then, then I could be absolutely miserable all the time, constantly fearing about, about tort God being torturing me maybe or, and, or constantly worrying about I have to sit pry over my sin all day long. Oh. Boy, I'm glad I'm not that kind of a Christian. I'm sorry. I thought one of the fruits was joy. Yeah. Joy and peace and sound mind and power. Yeah. Yeah. I, I have that joy, sister. It seems awful self-centered, doesn't it? I'm going to yeah. always be thinking about myself and my sin and seeing the devil everywhere instead of having joy, peace, power, sound mind, knowing my authority, knowing I'm in right standing with God. I have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. I have a dad I can call upon that will help me in my time of need. I can come boldly to the throne of grace. I'm the uh, child of the living God. That's wonderful stuff. I don't hear anything but fear and works and just emotionalism and, you know, outward righteousness. Yeah. And again, like you said, not once has he told you what Christ did for you. You know why? I, I did that video the other night, Luke. Uh, Einstein made a quote that said, if you can't explain something simply, it means you yourself don't understand it well enough. And so people that go, it's grace through faith, but you got to do this and that and this, they don't believe the gospel, nor do they understand what Christ has done. And if they did really believe it and trusted that the blood really was enough, they wouldn't feel a need to go, but this, but that, but this. They wouldn't need to do that. They would understand that God gives you his righteousness when you simply trust in what his son did. And that his son's blood washed away all your sins, that Jesus by himself purged your sins. And if no sin is on your account, there's none left to pay for. But they don't, and they can't, because they do not believe the gospel. I consider these people unbelievers. Yeah. I mean, to anybody listening now, if if you're not sure, let's say that you're a, a, a novice, you you don't you haven't really learned about Christianity. You're just looking into it. Um, I I want you to know that uh, this this form of Christianity is not the kind of Christianity that we find in the Bible. In the Bible, it's I would call it Christianity. I say Christianity because. It, everything, all, all of our faith, all of our confidence, and, and it comes from, it's from about Christ. But what Paul Washer is, is, is really, we should call it selfianity. It's about self. <laughs> yep. Uh, if you want to have the word <clears throat> about 
Uh, am I ever going to, am I really going to go to heaven? God, I hope I'm good enough. I hope I've repented enough. I hope I've got this sin out of my life enough. And you never know. If you want to be that kind of Christian, you worry and be in fear and sad all the time. That's what, he, that's the message he's preaching. But if you want to be the Christian that sends out in the Bible, you'll be focused on Jesus instead of focusing on yourself. And this, you'll find that the sin does leave your life because you're too busy thinking about Jesus all the time. Plus when you got that kind of heart in you, you're going to be looking for sin and everybody. You're going to point it out all over the place. That guy's not saved because he doesn't meet my little standard of righteousness. He doesn't meet whatever I say you got to be to be a Christian. And every Christian is going to have their own standards. And it's all going to be sins that they don't have a problem with. You know, you point out something like pride or uh, gossip. They, they won't acknowledge that in themselves. They're just going to find what you, when they're looking for sin everywhere. Remember that verse, uh, under the pure, all things are pure. But unto the, the unbelieving all, is nothing pure, but to the defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure. They see the devil everywhere. Everything's evil. Nothing's good. Just over religiosity. And it, there's no joy. And I'm telling you, it makes more atheists than, you know, Darwin did. It, it, they, it, it, it creates, it makes people run from God. And it's all about what you got to do. And I've heard so many people say, why well, I can't do it yet. I can't live up to it. Live up to what? Receiving a free gift? And then the religious hate the message of the cross. They hate it because it's free. And that sinner over there that you don't think deserves it can easily have it. And it really is about pride. They don't want it to be easy. I can't tell you how many people come on my channel and go, oh, you got your free fire insurance, your free ticket to heaven. Why do you despise his glorious, unspeakable gift? Your greasy grace, cheap grace, easy believism. What is hard about receiving a gift? And why do they hate it? You know, this is why. They all think they're good in some way, and they'll get this false humility. You know, oh, no, it's not me doing it. It's God in me. <laughs> it doesn't matter. It's still not about your works, regardless of it's God doing it or you doing it. But I fear, Brother Luke, that the majority of Christians are not born again. They are living the Christian life. They proclaim Jesus, but they've never been born again. They never believe the gospel. Believing the gospel entails that your sins have been purged and that you have eternal life. If you don't know you have eternal life because of what Christ did, you don't believe the gospel. And if they did, why would they keep adding to it? Yeah. Yeah. We got a 2004 just B, but Romans 12, one, I beseech you, uh, bre therefore brethren by, well, let me get back down here by, by the mercies of God that ye present your bodies, a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Yes. Yes. Well, I don't know. Uh, let me see. Uh, 2004, just be. I, I'm not familiar with you. So um, you might be trying to use that verse to argue against what we're saying here. But uh, we're, we're not saying don't present your body as, as a reasonable sacrifice, reasonable service. Yes. What do you think we're doing right now? This is a service that we're providing in our ministry. Uh, we and, and the others who, who work with us in these ministry works. These are works. But we're not doing these works for fear that we better work hard or we can't go to heaven. We better work hard or we could lose our salvation. We're doing these works because it's a, it's a labor of love. There's nothing I'd rather do than talk about Jesus with other people who love Jesus and the Bible. You don't have to twist my arm to do it. But if you take verses like that and you're trying to use it against people, 
to, 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 to make it become religious and legalistic, then you're not saved if that's the way you understand salvation. You don't understand the difference between service, serving God, and salvation. Salvation is a free gift. Service, that's our reasonable service. That's what we should be doing once we get saved. But we don't do it out of obligation. We do it because it just comes naturally to us because the Holy Spirit is in us. And uh, it's a joy. Let me read on. You say, oh, Brother Paul, but don't you know me? I don't need to know you. I know the word of God, and I know it's the same for every individual. Are you sensitive to sin? I want to read a passage to you just quickly. Just listen. It's one of my, uh, to me, it's one of the most blessed passages in all of Scripture. Let me ask you, is this your attitude? Has it ever been your attitude? God says, for my hand made all these things. Thus all these things came into being, declares the Lord. But to this one I will look, to him who is humble and contrite of spirit and trembles at my word. Do you tremble at his word or do you look for loopholes around it? Do you excuse your sin? Do you avoid the word uh, now because you know it's going to talk to you and talk about you? People come to me all the time and say, Brother Paul, I have a new relationship with God. And I go to 1 John chapter 1, verse 8. I say, do you have a new relationship with sin? Because if you don't have a new relationship with sin, you don't have a new relationship with God. Are you sensitive to sin? <sighs> what a miserable life that would be. To, I, to I don't focus kind of on sin anymore. The what? sin removed. Oh. Once purged, the person should have no more consciousness of sin. It doesn't mean when I when I make a mistake, I don't go, hey, help me, help me through this. Help me do better next time. But I'm not worried that the sin's condemning me. I have no more consciousness of it as far as it goes with my relationship to God. I've been justified. I've been made righteous. I'm the righteousness of God in Christ. Why am I looking at sin all the time? The strength of sin is the law. I'm going to look at Christ. I mean, he's got, I, I mean, bondage and fear and it just religion. It's just horrific. Oh, yeah. It's, it's as much bondage as if he was a, one of the Pharisees that Jesus was, was preaching against. Yeah, it's nothing. I, I mean, he's not setting anybody free. He's not giving anybody any good news. He's just the same as every other religious fanatic. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And if someone's watching and you, and, and you think he's right, then I guarantee you, you're not a Christian. You're not saved. You never put your faith in Jesus. Your faith is in your own ability, in your own efforts to get sin out of your life. And uh, that is a damnable heresy. Uh, that that belief cannot save anybody. I, I was I, I had to disfellowship a couple of brothers last year because they they said, "Oh, brother Luke, you don't be one of those one hundred percenters." What's one hundred percenter? Well, person that thinks that they, uh, you know, that you, you got to have one hundred percent faith in Jesus. Well. You know, hey, it's okay if someone believes in Jesus, but they also believe that they, they've got to do, you know, A, B, and C, too. I say, no, it's not. You know, I mean, how clear does it have to be made to you by the Apostle Paul that, that you cannot mix grace and, and works? They, they cancel each other out, and it becomes nothing. It becomes uh, valueless. You, uh, you, you, you make the cross of none effect. So, yeah, you got to be 100%. If you put 1% of your faith in your own ability and your own efforts to get sin out of your life, then you nullified the grace of God. You follow from grace. You don't have the grace of God. He says, now, third test. Boy, he's going to 
Are you, I hope I listen to everybody. I hope that you're uh, listening carefully. He's got all these tests that you've got to pass. It's found in verse three of chapter two. By this, we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. <clears throat> now listen to this. The one who says, I have come to know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar. And the truth is not in him. Now, let's look at this test. By this, we know that we have come to know him. You know, in America, I tell you what, I was talking to a Scotsman a while back in Peru, and he said, you Americans, your theology is 3,000 miles wide and one half inch deep. He's right. Well, uh, wait a minute. Yeah. You just took verses and put them together to say something they didn't say. He said, if you don't keep his commandments to say you're saved, the truth is not in you. That's not what it says. It says, we know we know him. Oh, hold on. It says, we know we know him when we keep his commandments. And that's about fellowship, right? We can recognize each other when we're loving the brethren. Then he brought another verse from the same book, but some, from somewhere else in another context, which says, if a man says he has no sin, the truth is not in him. And then he brought another portion from the verse that says, um, if we say we walk in the light and have not fellowship or something like that, he put all three of those together and made it say, if you don't keep his commandments, that means that you don't know him and therefore you're a liar and the truth isn't in you and therefore you're not saved. So he took three different verses, put bits of pieces of them all together to make it say something it did not say at all. That was sneaky. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, this point about, okay, uh, we got to follow his commandments uh, as, 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 as proof. But what's the people, the commandments, uh, first of all, the com word commandments, people always associate with the Ten Commandments. And then if you're really going to be, you know, uh, actually, uh, 100% correct uh, uh, applying it in that way, you have to say the 613 commandments or laws. Yep. The, there were 613 laws written down for Israel. Uh, Ten of them were written in stone. The others were written by, by Moses, but the 10 were written by God's finger on stone. So if you want to think of, we're talking about the commandments as those commandments given to Israel, you can be deceived by Paul Washer and, and you can be deceived by yourself not interpreting this correctly. Into Jesus the law. Says, commandments Jesus, of the law. Can, what Jesus' commandments are to, to love God and lo love yourself. And he said, and the commandment is to believe in the Son. Okay, that's what's, that's what's following the commandments. The other thing, the other thing that, Paul Washer and others. It was just, you better obey the gospel. Obeying the gospel is believing in the Son. That's, That's what the Bible right. says. The That's Bible right. interprets itself. So if you want to say, you got to obey the gospel. Obey, obey. Obeying the gospel means to believe the gospel. And, and then another one is, you got to do the will of the Father. But then it interprets itself. And the Bible says the will of the Father is to believe on the Son. Yep. So you're following the law. You're obeying um, the 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 gospel, and you're doing the will of the Father just by believing the gospel, believing in the Son of God for your salvation. That's right. You and obey the gospel is just another way, he says it, obey the truth. It means to believe on the Son, like you said. Believe that Christ died for your sins, was buried, and rose again on the third day. Because he says, for those that do not obey the truth, meaning they reject Christ. So obeying the gospel is to receive Christ. That's all it is, like Luke said. Yeah. Yeah, well, you're, you know, I, I told you, and it's, you know, you're, 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 you're catching it, Renee. You're seeing it you know, as we're going through here, and I hope everybody's realizing that in his sermon, all he's doing is piecing a verse here and a verse there, throwing them together to form a different, a different uh, doctrine, and sometimes not even a whole verse, just parts, parts of verses. And he's really, this is really eisegesis. This is, is, it's fraudulent. It's so dishonest. It's sickening. Uh, then he says. Our gospel here is pathetic, talking about in America. Our evangelism borderlines on heresy. How do you know that you came to know him? 
If you go to most pastors in this city right now and you say to them, I don't know whether or not I'm saved. This is the question they'll ask you. Was there ever a point in time in your life when you prayed and asked Jesus to come into your heart? If you say yes, they'll go, were you sincere? If you say, I think so, they'll say, then you're saved and you need, you need to stop the devil from bothering you. There's not a biblical bone in their brains. Okay, your comments on that, sister. All right. I know you got, I know you got something to say about that. I'm pulling that back up. Let me go to the actual. All right, the our gospel here is pathetic. Let me read. Can I read through that? Yeah. A, a bit. All right. Yeah. Hold on. Let me. Uh, well, read read through it and comment it as you go through it. Then. All right. Our evangelism borderlines on heresy. How do you know that you came to know him? Okay, here he's asking us to have faith in our faith. Okay, no, it's the object of faith. I know, I know him because he said that if I put my trust in him, that he'd give me eternal life and I believe him. So that's how I know. If you go to most pastors in the city right now and you say to them, I don't know whether or not I'm saved, this is the question I'll ask. Was there ever a point in time in your life where you prayed and asked Jesus to come into your heart? First of all, can't ask Jesus to come into your heart. You're saved because you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. You believe that his blood washed you clean, period. You have taken God at his word and trusted in it. And then he is in your heart because the Holy Spirit comes to dwell within you because you trusted him. If you say yes, they'll go, were you sincere? Again, asking you to look at your own self and in your own faith. Nobody here is telling you how to be saved. Nobody. If you say, I think so, they'll say, then you're saved. You need to stop the devil from bothering you. There's not a biblical bone in their brains. I, 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 I wouldn't say that. I'd say, do you understand what Christ did for you and that you have his imputed righteousness? And explain the gospel and tell them to stop trusting in themselves and their dead works and have faith towards God. Look what the Bible says. How can you know that you're saved? How can you know it? Look what he, it, the Bible doesn't say, how can you know you're saved? It says, I tell you these things that believe on the son of God so you may know that you have eternal life. That's what it says. And all those verses about examine yourselves and all that, it's not telling you to question your salvation. Again, on a fraud, it's Paul defending his apostleship. You want to examine that Christ is speaking through me? Well, examine yourselves. If Christ be in you, then I'm an apostle. All right. By this, we know that we've come to know him because our heart tells us. No, the heart of man is wicked. Who can know it? People have things in their heart all the time. I don't feel safe. Well, it's not about your feelings. Your heart can lie to you because we just feel it. Look what he says. By this, we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. No, we know that we know him when we keep the commandments. It's not saying we know that I know I'm saved because I keep his commandments. No, we know each other. This is about fellowship with the brethren. He said this is about uh, joy so your joy may be full so that you can have fellowship with God and fellowship with one another. So we know we know him. I know you know God because you love me and I'm one of the brethren. See, we recognize each other by keeping the commandment to love one another. And the commandments are not grievous because it's believe on the Son and love one another as I have loved you. And that and that keep there is in present tense as well as many other things in the text. And what he's saying is we keep on keeping his commandments. We know we know him. If we persevere, here comes his Calvinism, perseverance of the saints, garbage. No, according to the foreknowledge of the Father, he who began a good work in me will finish it till the day of redemption. I don't have to persevere because he preserves me. Whatever is necessary for salvation, he does. He's done. And then he goes on and says, the one who's uh, opposite doesn't know him. Now, I want you to look at something for a moment. What does it mean to keep his commandments? Does it mean to walk in sinless perfection? No. Again, it's a style of life. Garbage. It's not talking about that. It's talking about loving one another. It has nothing to do about a lifestyle. And there's your vague ambiguity. That's how you know it's a doctrine of demons. There's no specificity to it. It just gives you a vague thing. Your lifestyle must show up. Well, what if you were a heroin prostitute and you quit prostituting and you quit your heroin, but you still got some other stuff going on? Are you, are you saved enough? Well, what if it's just a housewife that didn't have any addictions? And she lives way better than that reformed prostitute. Is she saved? How do we know? Where's the bar? I always tell people you can't judge somebody's race when you don't know where their starting line was. And this is a perfect way for somebody to be judgmental 
and look at others is your lifestyle, your style of life. If we were to take your life out and film it every day, 24 hours a day, here we go, poking at other people, we would see a lifestyle that is desired to know God's commandments. Okay, here we go. Again, Brother Luke said, define those commandments. Because if you're talking about the law, whosoever is justified by the law, you're following the grace. Christ is of no effect to you, whosoever you are justified by the law. For him that worketh not, but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, your faith is counted for righteousness. Because you believe God, it's counted to you for righteousness. It's imputed righteousness, but he's telling you to earn your own righteousness by living good enough. <sighs> Are you growing in victory and obedience and was also broken when it didn't obey? So you got to fall apart when you break one of the laws and then <sighs> you say, well, I've kept the commandments before. You can forget what he's saying. You must keep on keeping perseverance, preservation, not perseverance. I, I'm I, I'm so angry right now. I want to spit. That's how I feel. It's horrific what he's telling people. He's telling people to look at themselves, have faith in your faith. You must, you must be keeping the commandments or you're not a real Christian. You must have a lifestyle change, a vague standard of righteousness that nobody can judge. Just ridiculous. How do you have assurance like that? He's not going to know if he's saved till he dies. Because he won't know if he persevered enough. Because he's he, him and John Piper and all of them, they're all looking to their own righteousness to prove they're one of the elect. You know you're one of the elect when you trust Christ alone. That's how you know you're one of the elect. Because you've trusted in Christ and not yourself. It's just his Calvinism is darkening everything, Luke. It's polluting the whole message. Mm -hmm. It's horrific. Yeah, uh, when he, when he gives this example of uh, um, uh, asking Jesus into your heart, uh, well, this is an example of what I've been saying that he'll he'll say something that we say, well, you're right. You don't get saved by asking Jesus in, into your heart. You know, uh, we don't say that. We we identify that as that's the wrong way of thinking. Uh, and so you think, well, he's he, he's he's right, but then he makes it just a, 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 a some good point, and then he then he ends up making it a, a damnable heresy. Uh, and then were you sincere? Uh, then you are saved, and you need to stop the devil from bothering you. Well, I would say, not uh, was there a time in your life when. You prayed and asked Jesus to come into your heart. I would say, was there a time in your life where you put your faith completely on Jesus and, and you believe that what he did on the cross finished everything that was necessary for your salvation? There's nothing required for, for you to do because Jesus did it all for you on the cross. And did you ever come to a conclusion and believe that Jesus... Uh, guarantees you're going to go to heaven he guarantees you eternal life because you put your faith in him now that's the kind of question i want to find out how their their uh, thoughts on that and if then i would say yes if you ever came to that conclusion even if you got confused later you're you did re get born again and uh the devil could be trying to uh, steal your faith or uh, what's the phrases uh shipwreck your faith or uh, the fiery darts of the of the the devil uh, coming against you trying to make you uh um ruin your faith so he takes a point that's valid i would say the same thing well no you, you don't get saved by asking jesus to come into your heart you need to understand that it's finished believe that you don't have to work to heaven because he did it all for you. And just, just thank Jesus and believe that he did it all for you. You need to get that straight and understand that and believe that. And then if that is the case, then don't let the bother the devil bother you anymore. I would say that. And, and regarding the, uh, by this, we know that we have come to know him. If we keep his commandments, we've already said that we're we're not under 10 commandments we're not under 613 commandments we're under the commandment of jesus believe on the son for your for salvation 
Obey the gospel. Do the will of the Father. That is to believe in the Son. That's what that's what we need to uh, we know we know him if we, we do that. And persevering. Yeah, you're right. Uh, there's there's a difference between perseverance and preservation. The Calvinist viewpoint, the Lordship viewpoint, is that you've got to persevere your whole life. You've got to continually strive and work and 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 uh, obey. And if you persevere in that, and you persevere in your faith, your faith never gets weakened at any point. Then maybe then at the end, if you've persevered all the time, then perhaps you've been good enough to go to heaven. But that's not what the Bible says. The Bible is uh, tells us of preservation. We're preserved. The Bible says that even if we have no faith, if we lose our faith, our faith wanes uh, be because of like like the parable of the the the, the, the sower. Their seed that falls falls on thorny ground. Their seed that falls in shallow ground, and it and it eventually dies. But guess what? Those seeds did spring to life. But they got choked away by the cares of the world, temptations, and so on. So it didn't grow and, and didn't didn't flourish and didn't have fruit. And uh, but it did spring to life. So uh, a person, uh, we know that even if they have problems, you believe, and then you have problems in your walk until you die. You, your faith wanes, or you're, you're, you get into sin, and you get become a backslidden son, like the backslidden parable, uh, parable of the prodigal son, that the Bible says, even if we have no faith, he remains faithful. He cannot deny himself. That means that Jesus will uh, be faithful to keep the promise. He promised eternal life to all of us. If we'll put our faith in him, he'll do the rest and he'll keep us saved no matter what else we do. Oh, now uh, let me see. Where did you stop reading here? Uh, I'll mark it for next time because, uh, okay, we'll pick up with page, uh, uh, this is on the, Trying to find what page that one was. We just did. Eight. Eight. See, I don't see the number. Oh, yeah, eight. Eight, page eight. So we'll pick up with page nine. Let's say the end of page eight. Let me see. Okay. okay. Where it says, now look at verse four, the one who says, I have come to know him. No. Um, I guess we talked about that enough. Let's just pick up with page nine next time. He's sneaky, Luke, taking yeah. bits of several verses and putting them together. And then saying it's talking about a lifestyle change. Well, yeah, that's why I wanted, uh, since I I, list, I listened to his sermon before we started this to freshen up my mind so I knew what we were dealing with. And I, I could see very clearly how sneaky he is. And he's basically, he's cutting and pasting all over to, 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 to try to prove a heresy. Yep. Okay, let's take a minute, just look at the chat room, see if, if anybody has like a question or something that we need to respond to, go ahead and post it and we'll take a couple of minutes before we're finished here. Uh, let me see. Yeah, I want to say something real quick. Go Honey, there, there's a girl in there that takes antidepressants or something. Do not stop your meds. You'll get Christians all day long telling you, you don't need those meds. You don't look. Psychological is physical. The brain has chemistry. It is a physical thing. I was hospitalized for it, for suicide. You can see I split both my wrists. I'm off that med now, but I was not convicted to do it for salvation. And I was on them for many years. Once I got to a certain place, I felt it was time, but I didn't do it for any spiritual reason and because somebody told me to. Little by little, I did that. And I still take some medications for my disability. I get judged for it constantly. But when I said that which is flesh is flesh, that which is spirit is spirit. It has nothing to do with your spiritual condition if you need physical help medically. No, Luke was a physician. Paul tells uh, Timothy to take wine for his often infirmities in his stomach. So there is nothing wrong with taking prescribed medication for something you need. Please don't let people tell you this. A lot of people tell you, oh, psychiatry is pharmacia and blah, blah, blah. I know that people commit suicide when they suddenly stop their medications. These people are not doctors and there is nothing wrong 
with getting help physically for a fallen body. This body is still in a fallen state. It is not perfected when you get saved. Okay. It is still the old man. So don't, don't go suddenly off your medication. I don't want that. They had somebody in MacArthur's like youth camp kill themselves because he told them not to take his meds and he committed suicide. Please. You're, you're going to hear like 20 different people in the Christian church tell you why you don't need them. I know the danger of doing that. And I ask you not to stop your medication, please. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, sister. Yeah. Uh, I'll tell you what though, if I list, if I didn't know the truth and I heard Paul Washer and I believed in that form of Christianity, I would need some medication. <laughs> I would be so depressed and worried all the time in tears and fear that I'd need some kind of medication to cope with, with it. Uh, Natalie, but, yes, you can be in danger. I'm so sorry, Luke. You can be in danger when you take them, but this girl's in more danger when she doesn't. So let's not give medical advice on here because I don't want anybody killing themselves because somebody felt condemned for taking their meds. But we appreciate your warning. I'm so sorry, Luke. Yeah. I, I had I had to deal That's with all right. And uh, let me respond. We got Tommy McDonough here. Uh, of course, I haven't seen your name before, and you say that you're a new, uh, new Christian. Uh, uh, please, uh, I hope you continue joining us on Wednesday nights. Also join us uh, on Sunday. We have a uh, actual uh, the Church of the Eternally Secure, a, a, a Sunday church service we do online. It's 5 p.m. Eastern time on this same channel, Sin City Preacher. Uh, join us in our congregation on Sundays, too. Uh, I want to make sure... Tommy and Madonna, that you understand um, what Christianity really is, the Christianity found in the Bible, uh, and also uh, uh, even to, even when people understand it correctly initially, sometimes they get led astray and fall into apostasy. That's that's uh, the false doctrines uh, later because they um, because they listen to some false teachers. So I, I hope you'll I hope you'll uh, continue with us on Wednesdays and Sundays and. So we can build up your, your, uh, your, make your doctrine solid. Let me see if there's the raptures. And some, okay. Still disagreeing. They caused it. Okay. Well, I'll tell her to listen to her doctor. Okay. Uh, all right, sister, give 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 some final remarks, uh, and then I'll say good night to everybody. Yeah, my my uh. Uh, Rigel says, hello, hello, you didn't get to see you guys, hello. Um, my thing is, if you keep your eyes on Christ and not your sin and not yourself and not on rules, you just tend to do what's right because you're, he's always on your mind. He's always with you. It just, you know, Peter sank in the water when he took his eyes off Jesus. We sink in the water when we take our eyes off of him. Don't focus on law. Don't focus on... The storm, which is us and our crazy minds and the flesh and this world, keep your eyes on Christ. You know, it's it's not a bunch of rules you keep. You can't, and those in the flesh cannot please God. You can't please God with performance. You please God because you took him at his word. When he said his son gives you eternal life and that life is in his son, that he purged all your sins through his own precious blood he died once for all. That's how you please him. Trusting him, taking him at his word. You cannot earn salvation by anything you do, but but believing what was already done. Thank you, guys. I hope to see you Sunday. Okay, I'll say good night. But first, uh, Celine asked if I would read her comment. So it says she says I used to have the perfectionist attitude, thinking God would throw me into hell. Then the more my flesh really weakened, I changed my mind and believed on Jesus and realized I'll never, I don't, I don't see the end of it. Sorry, I can't find the end of it. I never, I'll never, whatever. I'm sorry, Selena, I don't see the end of the comment there. But uh, I think I can fill in the blanks for you. That uh, when we realize that we'll never be able to uh, present a perfect self to God. Say, look at me, God. Wasn't I perfect? 
No, you wouldn't. We'll never be able to do that. That, that when we need to understand that in order to realize that we need Jesus to, to provide salvation for us because we can't earn it on our own. It's impossible. That's what we need to understand. And then we call say, Jesus, uh, I have to depend on Jesus instead. And when you depend on Jesus 100% and, 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 and put no faith in yourself, that's when Jesus gives you the gift of eternal life. And it does come with a guarantee that you can never lose it no matter what. You're guaranteed you're going to go to heaven once you put your faith entirely on Jesus. Okay, I guess that'll be the last word. Uh, thank you to everybody in the chat room for participating. And Sister Renee, thanks again for being here with me tonight. And um, everybody, please join us uh, Sunday, 5 p.m. Eastern, and Wednesday again. We got probably several more of these before we're finished with this Paul Washer sermon. If, if It's hard to stomach, really. It's really hard to get through it. It just it makes me almost as sick. Maybe it's just as bad as the sermon from uh, uh, Jonathan Edwards. Yeah, this one this one's worse though to me. Oh, yeah, it is. Okay, thank you, everybody. Bless you all in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus.